I think that there's a paradigm shift in food consumption. And it's evidenced by the fastest growing food consumer group that is called the Low House Consumer. And it stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. And they don't look at food as yucky, gross, or not gross. They look at food as either healthy, and food that will contribute to longevity and, and functional healthy life, or food that doesn't. So when they consider this as food, it ticks all those boxes. It's sustainable and it's healthy. And that, that part of the food consumer group is growing. And there's a lot of pent up demand um, for food that ticks those boxes. And again, in, in the powder form, which may be lame from a gastronomical or a kind of um, chef's perspective, it still enables um, that consumer to be able to start somewhere. And that's what this is about for us. It's about starting somewhere, starting to make a difference, and starting to make an impact. And if 10 or 15 years later, people embrace the idea of eating the kinds of foods that, that the chefs prepared in the documentary, then, then that's a wonderful thing. Um, but for, for now, I think that, that it's, a, it's a, a great place to start and enable people with a very small barrier, optically or, or with respect to cultural appropriation, on what is really gross and not gross. It fascinates me that a massively obese person chowing down on a Twinkie drinking a Coca-Cola looks at my food and goes, that's disgusting. Um, it's one of the great ironies of, of the North American diet. Why, uh, why bugs and not beans? Like, what advantage do insects have over, just say, getting your protein from beans? So the number one advantage is the iron in B12. There, there's no B12 in beans, and there's no um, uh, myoglobin protein. So this is the interesting thing that's starting to be addressed from the clinical or medical side, is that not all protein is created equally. So even protein that's in meat, which contains hemoglobin and myoglobin, or protein from an insect, which only contains myoglobin, and a different kind of protein in a bean, which may not have all nine essential amino acids, is very, very, very clinically different than the protein from, um, from the cricket. And unfortunately, because I eat meat too, and we are not an anti-meat company, that's not what this is about, but one of the reasons why red meat may be cl clinically unhealthy is because of the hemoglobin and, and the impact that cooking hemoglobin has on human tissue, whereas the insects that just have the myoglobin are much healthier. So the main thing is that the, the insects, the crickets, have fiber, which meat doesn't have, and it's very rich in B12, which plants don't have. That's an answer, then. Um, I was going to say, in regards to your question, you should try drinking uh, before you eat the bugs. Um, I, I, I'm being facetious about it, but actually I, I had a chance to meet the gentleman in the film, and at the Nordic Food Lab they sell anti-gin. It's gin made of ants, and it's amazing. And they pound this stuff back, and they actually say they don't get hangovers from it. They even ferment the ants? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's really expensive, though. If you go to Copenhagen, take 100 euros for you there. So basically in 2013, the uh, white paper was referenced in the documentary, and it was titled Edible Insects for Food and Beef Security that came out in 2013. And almost at the very same time, um, a gentleman named Pat Crowley was on Shark Tank, and he had developed a protein bar. His company is called Chapul, the EXO was featured in the film. And Mark Cuban invested in his company. So I called my brothers up and I said, this is pretty serendipitous. There's three ducks that have lined up really perfectly. One is the FAO in the United Nations, um, you know, talking about edible insects for food and feed security, um, consumer type products that could infuse it into them, and Mark, guys like Mark Cooper investing in those products, and you guys know how to farm insects. So we have the three pegs of the stool in place, and I said, why don't we start North America's first human grade insect farm, let's that, raise some money and see what happens. So we did and we started with the 5,000 square foot farm and that was around January 2014. And today our farm's about 60,000 square feet. Um, there's three 20,000 square foot farms and each one contains about 33 million crickets. So I say we have the largest farm in the world. We have over 100 million head of livestock. The livestock's about this size. Um, and uh, that, that growth and the, the size of the farm is a reflection of the growth in the market.
Um, before we go to the audience, just uh, I, I want to sort of leap up from off that a little bit. Obviously, we, we see the samplings of, um, are they dehydrated mealworms and crickets up there? But powder seems to be the most um, consumable or sellable product in regards to crickets. Is, is that what you're finding? And I'm curious also in regards to who's buying the product itself. I mean, what are you selling exactly? I know you're selling crickets and mealworms, but how is that being sold? So the powder is really, you know, we could say uh, crickets are the gateway bug. And the powder is really the way, the least offensive or uh, culturally um, challenging way to get the benefits, sustainability, and the health benefits into foods that we already know. So you could bake it into muffins or a pizza crust, into a protein bar, put it into a soup or a chili. So it's very, very shelf stable. It's very easy, you know, you know to, to bake with and cook with. Um, it's it's obviously the ground floor of the gastronomy experience. You know, we rely on chefs like Mark to take the actual insect and present it in a delicious, yummy way that may be optically more challenging for most Westerners, but extremely delicious as we can see the, the possibilities again in the film. Chef Mark, oh, sorry, can I start? Can I start? Yeah, what, are, what are the current legal boundaries about raising insects for human consumption? So the, there are allowances under the Novel Food Act in North America, Europe, and, and Canada, um, or the US and Canada, because insects are in all our food, in our salad, our peanut butter, our chocolate. Um, so there are no provisions. In fact, when we um, started our farm in OMAP, where the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture came out, there was actually no designation for an insect farm. It hadn't existed before, and we, ha we have now been designated as a farm. But we're working closely with the CFIA and OMAFRA to begin to develop regulations around the farming side as well as the processing side. So, so we think it's important and we welcome those regulations. And so we're just beginning, but also it's legal because by accident, insects are already in our food, so we don't have a law prohibiting that. Correct. <laughs> There's no insects by accident in our food, by the way, here at our concession. Um, <laughs> Chef Mark, I'm curious, I mean, um, Jared sort of mentioned something, and obviously it was mentioned in the movie as well, which is really about um, the packaging of, of the insects for consumption. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that uh, uh, you know, raw fish, sushi, you know, was kind of looked upon in, in, in the Western culture as being really strange and bizarre, and then all of a sudden now it's just become commonplace. What are the challenges, especially for the bugs piece, or even going back further from that, on how, I don't want to use the word packaging, but how, how you're presenting um, the insects for consumption. I know that you do an amazing cricket lime pie down uh, at the CME. Um, so I'm just curious on, on your sort of, um, your experiments of things that have gone right and things that have gone wrong along that way. Well, let's, uh, let's start with a couple things that, that went wrong uh, in, in, in our testing. Um, uh, the biggest hit down at the CME was uh, was the bug dog. Uh, for one reason, it, it, every you know appreciate what a hot dog looked like. It wasn't foreign to them. But even when you saw crickets on them, they're like, well, I, you know, at least we're going to try it. And um, you know, the comments in the movie and uh, in, in the film were, were very very accurate. Uh, you 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 heard, you all heard that they, every time they, they try something, they, they reference some sort of um, a savoriness and then nuttiness. So, like the nuttiness balance was 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 prominent in the crickets and the mealworms that we used both in the powder and in the crickets. Um, when I first, you know, got the product, I was so excited. I'm gonna make a 100% cricket hot dog. <laughs> that was horrible. You know, because the, because again, they are so healthy uh, in that there's no fat content in them, and you, you do need fat to carry the flavors, right? So, um, not to get preachy, I, I don't really. Think that any of the food that I that I'm designing can be 100 percent, but it is such a nutritional benefit to it, and it's it, it's a lot healthier, and it's just it's it's raised awareness also, and it, it, and it's fun. It's really so fun. what did you what did you add to um, to to bind or emulsify it into a hot dog? Well, I, actually, I used uh, you know organic free and hormone free beef, and then I just I used that almost as a, like a 10 percent spice blend. And it was dry, so it actually worked out to be 50, about 15 percent of the actual um, uh, volume of the, of the hot dog, and then so that that gave the flavor. And I, 
because of the nuttiness, and you did hear some bitterness comments too, uh, I, I got this, uh, this Tabasco uh, uh, powder and I put that in just to carry over the flavor so that the finish wouldn't be bitter. Uh, and then just so you, you know that there were crickets in the hot dog, uh, there was a little slaw on top and we had some lime chili crickets from Entimo on top like that and he was very, very visual. And uh, yeah, and they were, they were nice and roasted and dry so they weren't moving around. So I didn't get any problems with those. I like how you used the hot dog as, uh, as that because that's the mystery meat anyways, right? So why not throw some insects in there? You know, they were probably in there before similar to what we were talking about. So, you know, it's really, really early days. For, for the farming and the industrialization of growing, raising insects and processing them into something like a powder. So it is the most expensive that it will ever be. And I think that it is incumbent upon us and, and, and our number one goal really as a, as a company and, and the groups we're associated with is to learn how we can drive the price down. But that conversation shouldn't usurp really the conversation of value because as it's important for us to, to bring the price down. What we're also learning is that the value of it is going up. And what I mean by that is that, for example, a study just came out looking at the concentration of uh, five minerals, iron, zinc, magnesium, manganese, and copper. And it found that not only was it far, far higher in, for example, the cricket powder, but much more importantly, it was far more bioavailable. So, so another study just came out of Korea where they fed post-operative patients mealworms as part of the regular hospital diet, and the group that were fed the mealworms had much better clinical results post-operatively than the group that was just fed um, the regular diet. Um, there's opportunity to feed to livestock. It's, it's very possible that by adding this ingredient to traditional livestock feed, you could drastically reduce if not eliminate the amount of antibiotics needed for hog farming or chicken farming and things of that nature. So it's very difficult to say what the value of it is. If, if for example, it can play a major role in preventing heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and, and other systemic conditions of poor diet, then what is that worth? So, so that is, we're just on the, on, you know, on the first pitch of the first inning. In terms of learning what the possible clinical and health benefits are. There are some really awesome initiatives that I'd love to get it to, to, to talk to you guys about in, in a minute, but I think that those two things will happen together. Price will come down, the value will come up, and it will find a point of harmony that makes sense to the, to the major food producers and to the consumers of that food.